Welcome once again to another episode of Scott Talks Law. So this is an episode whereby Scott Talks Law, and in this episode, shall be talking about opinion evidence under Evidence Law Two. So uh, the opinion evidence is covered for from Section Forty Eight to Fifty Four of the Evidence Act, but the Evidence Act does not uh, define uh, specifically define what opinion is. So opinion evidence is that evidence that has been perceived by someone through his or her senses. And this person uses this evidence or presents this evidence in court on basis of his or her own opinion. So, as a general rule, opinion evidence is inadmissible. The court does not allow opinion evidence because opinion evidence does, is not based on the facts in issue, does not relate to the facts in issue. Just the same way as character evidence and hearsay evidence are inadmissible, opinion evidence is also inadmissible in court because um, the court won't allow it to be, to, won't allow opinion evidence because it does not relate to the facts in issue. So we have exemption where opinion evidence can be administered and we are going to look at them where the evidence is by experts, non-experts and the evidence relates to the facts in issue. Then the court shall administer opinion evidence on those basis. So we're going to look at the reason as to why this opinion evidence is not as administered, the rationale of uh, inadmissibility of opinion evidence, and you're going also to look at the parade, the process that involves the identification of an accused person by identifying witness. So an identifying witness is taken through a parade to identify the accused person. We're going also to look at the identification process uh, during this uh, episode. So opinion evidence is covered for from section 45 to 50, 48 to 54 of the Evidence Act. And this is the testimony of wit the testimony of witness should be based on what he or she has perceived by medium of his or her senses and it should be factual. So it's a general rule, uh, so it's a general rule that opinion evidence as to the non-existence or existence of facts in issue or relevant facts is inadmissible. That's a general rule. Whether or not it uh, relates to the existence or wants to determine the non-existence of facts in issue, opinion evidence is not inadmissible. And uh, the evidence to be tendered by a witness must be direct the subject to expectation which uh, it is prescribed. It must relate to the subject which it is prescribed. So the rationale for an admissibility of opinion evidence. So the court does not allow opinion evidence on this basis because uh, if the court will allow opinion evidence, it will um, it will it will be seen as an interruption of the role of the court because this is just evidence on people's opinion. So you can imagine a situation where many people are coming up with their own opinion about a, a particular thing or particular facts. So this will be interrupting the court's. Uh, the court's role in the role the role of the court the role of the court is the one that is supposed to come up uh, with the decision the court is supposed to come up with the decision to determine the case and people are coming up with their own opinion people are just creating uh, becoming judges by themselves and coming up with their own opinion so this will be seen as interrupting the role of the court it will be seen as hearsay it will be a different person may draw a different opinion over the same uh, facts and hence uh, no benchmark. The assumption is that a witness give false in evidence he or she cannot be prosecuted for uh, perjury because perjury involves making correct utterance or incorrect facts and opinion evidence is irrelevant. So um, the reasons as to why the court does not allow opinion evidence because admissibility of opinion evidence will interrupt the process, process of the court or the the process of the court that involves coming up with the decision, it will be seen as a hearsay because the court will be forced to hear what other people say about particular issues or facts. So the court, it will be seen as hearsay and hearsay evidence is inadmissible. And uh, people who um, who uh, make utterances on the make opinion evidence are not subject to uh, perjury. Perjury is that offense that is uh, punishable when someone makes false utterances. So opinion evidence is not punishable in court of law. So the court is, will not allow this opinion evidence because on the basis of um, that someone who, who uh, admit opinion evidence is not uh, punishable. It's not an offense to uh, adduce uh, opinion evidence under uh, perjury. So opinion evidence is also irrelevant. It does not, it's not uh, relevant to the facts in issue. It's irrelevant. So the merger of facts and opinion, there are, there are instances where these facts and opinion can be merged. You know opinion evidence is not admissible because it does not relate to the facts in issue. But you have situations where this opinion evidence can be merged with the facts. 
can be merged with the facts or can be combined with the facts. So as the facts are read or the, as the facts are exist, the opinion evidence can also be put to those facts. So and these are cases where this opinion evidence relates to color, speed, or age. So in practice, there are instances in which uh, it is practical to separate an opinion from a fact. And these instances involves evidence about color, age, and speed. So evidence that involve color, age, and speed cannot uh, be separated from facts. They can be combined with the facts. So someone giving evidence about someone's size, someone either if this person was dark skin or light skinned, then those evidence the court can allow, even though they are opinion evidence, because they can be merged with the facts to um, guide the court. So, um, so if you say that someone was middle sized, that is an opinion evidence and can also be merged with the fact because it's led with color, size, and speed. So uh, there are three exemptions to this rule of opinion evidence. And these are evidence by experts, non experts, and evidence that relates to the facts in issue. So, if this evidence is of an expert, an expert is someone who has a particular skills in a particular field, and these skills are not um, there, in, the court does not have their skills in those particular fields, then the court will permit the expert in that particular field to come and adduce evidence according to his opinion and his experience in that particular field. And this experience does not necessarily mean academic experience or qualification. Even practical skills uh, can be uh, qualify someone to become an expert. And an expert are also are people who don't have that um, uh, skills, but the, the evidence by an expert relating to handwritings, like handwritings, can also be administered in court. And if this opinion evidence relates to the facts in issue, they can be merged with the facts under the merger, merging of opinion and facts. So those are the three exemptions as to where uh, opinion evidence can be administered in court. So expert, expert, under expert opinion, the matter may also be technical that it calls for a specialized skills and knowledge of an expert. So the expert's knowledge must be that which is outside the court's knowledge. And in the case of R versus Turner 1975, A-double-L-E-R, Opinion from the knowledgeable person about a man's personality, mental makeup, plays a part in many judgments. An expert's opinion is admissible to furnish the court with specific, specific which is likely to be outside the experience of a jury or a judge. So the judge may not be experienced or the jury may not be experienced in that matter, then it can call an expert according to the case of R versus Turner. In the case of uh, Davy versus Edinburgh Magistrates, 1953, SC 34. The role of an expert is to furnish the judge with necessary scientific criteria for the test for testing the accuracy of the conclusion. So neither the judge or the jury is bound by the opinion of an expert, even if it's not uh, contradicted. So an expert is just supposed to give that his or her own opinion about that fact, but this opinion does not um, prejudice the entire process. Does not uh, is not prima facie acceptable. Does not. Um, is not supposed to be relied on. The court is supposed to come up with an independent judgment, but not on the basis of this expert's opinion, because experts can be um, can be corrupted by someone, and they can just give evidence that is not correct. So the court is supposed to come up with their own decision independent of this expert's opinion, and. Um, this expert's opinion is just that opinion that is outside the knowledge of the court. So you have uh, medical issues that the court is not aware. We have uh, issues that the court is not aware. Then this court will permit the calling of experts in particular sections where this the issue, identifiable places where this issue, uh, this expert should be called, and their role should be specified, and their identity must be uh, must be given. So in the case of Lord Abinja versus Ashton, 1873-17 EQ-558, in matters of opinion and uh, distrust, so this is where an expert's opinion can be distrusted. It's not just uh, a, a, a good practice to trust an expert's opinion, according to the case of Lord Abinja versus Ashton. So... Um, in determining who an expert is, uh, in the, ca the case of Gicheru, son of Jaguar versus Republic, I try to uh, define who an expert is. And according to this uh, case, an expert is not just that person who has academic qualification or academic um, 
uh, knowledge in particular field but an expert can also include someone who has uh, practical skills and knowledge in a particular field so um, the, the case of Stephen versus Republic 1973 EA22 this is the case that involved two accused person and uh, two accused person who were involved in uh, drug abuse so these persons were entered and went to some a place a camp, camping a uh, place and engaged in abuse of drugs so they were using cannabis sativa so the two arresting police arrested them and one of the police um said that according to the knowledge that he had he could identify the specific drug that these persons were using so the court could admit that particular evidence by that police because it's evidence about the his or her own perception or his or her own opinion according to what the experience that he has not uh, academic qualification not academic um, knowledge or experience but his own practical experience and knowledge that he has acquired so this opinion if does not necessarily mean that it should be academically acquired it can also be practically acquired according to the case of Stephen versus R so this case was appealed but upon appeal they, it was convicted because this is on an, based on someone's opinion according to this his or her own experience in that particular field so the court overturned the appeal in that uh, particular case so uh, the the court overturned that appeal in the case of r versus silver lock 1894 2qb 776 the court accepted the expert evidence of a solicitor as a handwriting expert because though he was not schooled in that matter, he was experienced then uh, there in the, uh, through keen interest. So this solicitor had keen interest in that particular matter to acquire those skills. So the evidence according to this uh, solicit the evidence of this solicitor on the basis of the handwriting was administered in court according to the case of R versus Silver Lock. And the court must be in the court must also be informed of the ex person or the expert who is coming to give uh, uh, evidence and the area in which he's coming to give evidence. So those particular areas must be specified to the court. The court must be aware, then he must give his name, address, education, professional experience in that particular field. So let's look at non experts. And then an expert's opinion can be given on three bases. On the basis of handwriting, identity, and some opinion. And the identity, you're going to look at the identification parade. And the identification parade, this way an expert gives his opinion in determining who the accused person, who the person that he identified or is seen is so committing a particular crime. So this is given on three bases. The basis of handwriting, or the basis of identity, and someone's opinion so or on some opinions so handwriting or signature uh, this is where someone has interacted with this person and is able to familiarize his or her handwriting then this person can give evidence on the basis of handwriting so the court held that a person can give opinion on human physical experience emotional or emotional matters weather conditions lightning behavior of vehicle behavior of a vehicle uh, conditions of object and writing distance and value identification and speed according to the case of Sherald Sherald versus Jacob in 1965 n so uh, let's look at identity the second category under the evidence of non expert and let's look at the identification parade so this identification parade is that process that involves the identification of an accused person so identifying witness is taken through a parade where an accused person so many people are so this person is supposed to spot that specific person that he saw in uh, the scene of crime or committing the crime so uh, the identification parade uh, the procedure for identification parade was laid out from the case of r versus mwango son of muna 1936 eaca 29 as for and it was held as for there are 12 processes so accused must be informed that uh, has the right to have an advocate or um, friend in that parade. The second one, the officer in charge may be present but does not conduct the parade. The third one, witness must not see the accused person before the parade. The fourth one, the accused person is placed among others 
of at least uh, a person who are of possible similar age, size, height, and lifestyle. Number five, the accused person is allowed to take a position he chooses and he can change the position after uh, witnesses, every witness has, uh, after each witness has identified. So it's supposed to shift uh, after after each identifying witness has left. So it should shift. The sixth one, the failure of identify, the, the, the failure, the to ensure that the defending witness does not talk to each other after they have after being at the parade. The seventh one to exclude all persons who have no business at that parade. The eighth one is to carefully not the carefully not should be taken after each witness have has identified uh, the suspects and under what circumstances or basis they have identified. The ninth one uh, the witness should die, the witness so uh, ninth one the witness so if the witness directly identified the suspect, so if the witness uh, decides that the suspect should talk, remove his hat or put uh, it or see him walk, put it on or see him walk, the suspect should do so, um, should apply to all persons in the parade. So uh, the suspect should do according to what he has been uh, requested. And the tenth one, the witness should touch the person um, he or she identifies at the parade the 11th one at the end of the parade the accused must be asked whether or not he was satisfied by the process and if it was conducted in a just manner the 12th one the parade um, the, the the parade must be conducted in fair the principle of fairness should be observed in the entire process so uh this this the accused must be informed uh, the right to have an advocate and must be carefully uh, present. So this identification process, this person must touch that particular person. You should not suppose just for it, must go further and touch the person that she's claiming to have suspected. And if you require this person to remove or to appear in a particular manner, this person should appear in a particular manner that is being required, requested, and as well as all people in the parade. And this person being presented in the parade must be put with other people who have similar, similar traits and character with him to just provide that legitimacy and accuracy so that not a wrong person is chosen but that uh, sus the right suspect is selected and they after the end of the parade the accused person must be asked whether or not the parade was conducted in a fair manner and give his opinion as to the conclusion of the entire parade uh, process and the, the accused, the any people who have no business at the parade must not uh, be present. And the police officer, the defending police, can also be at the parade, but they have they are not supposed to conduct the parade. They are not supposed to conduct uh, the parade, and uh, they are not supposed to conduct the parade. And uh, the identifying witness should not talk to each other after they have uh, gone through the identifying process and they should be kept in a separate process so that they cannot talk to each other so guys uh, that is the end of my lecture about uh, opinion evidence and uh, hope you've understood and just subscribe to course legal channel comment on the comment section and like the episodes as well have a nice day